Hello, good afternoon, uh, viewers and listeners. It's exciting to be here on February 7th to resume our poetry or reading. And I'm excited today to present three wonderful poets and whose books I've enjoyed reading. So we have Kathleen O'Toole, and then we have Outress Bethany White, and we have Alice Freiman. I'm going to be introducing them individually and talking about their work. But one, one thing I will mention that cuts across all these three different books of poetry is that they are all concerned with the subject of identity. So my introduction of the books will go into that. And right now, I would like to begin with Catherine O'Toole, whose bio you already have, so I won't mention a lot of what's there, but I will go straight into the book this far. When I read this book, uh, these poems do evoke who we are in faith and action, in the journey we are on. Kathleen brings our attention to the moments when we pause to look at what's really before us. A hummingbird's roaring appetite, a hawk and mouse caught in the dance of death, a robin that reminds us of a loved one, or a blackbird's insistent calls, summoning us to save a life, to behold our incarnate beings stitched in bird songs, grief and grace binding and connecting us. There's real communion here. So without wasting much time, Kathleen, you're welcome to read. Thank you, Mildred. And uh, it's delightful to be with these other lovely poets today. And I um, would like to just say a great thank you to Malaprops. I spent a couple of years trying to line up this reading and was happy to have gotten it for last October and now to be here virtually with so many friends from around the country. Um, the only thing I, I would like to say about the book is that I think of this far as being um, a series of linked movements as in a musical composition. And so I'm gonna read a couple of poems from each movement or section of the book and then um, one recent COVID era poem for you. And the first section really um, consists of elegies to uh, honor the saints in uh, my personal and poetic life. And the first um, poem is an elegy to my father, who's really the ghost behind many of the poems in this book. Pruning the rhododendron, dead branches waiting for the ax since winter's weight of snow, mother sighs, your father gave up, he'd rather cut it down. I contemplate the facts planted to christen their new home 50 years ago. It nearly surmounts the roof. Since his first pneumonia bout, new fists of purple have begun to bloom, starbursts on withering limbs. Weigh this, one should wait until the blossoms die. Still, I grab the lopper, channel all my intention, releasing each dry bough onto a growing pile. For your penance, a decade, thy will, endurance. I find I use my hands uh, in reading poems and that may have something to do with the next poem in which I, I like to say elegies don't have to be sad, they can be playful. And this acknowledges my uh, Italian half and in particular my Italian grandmother. Half Italian, the brain's hardwired with the impulse to feed when given the chance. And it's why I always double the garlic in any recipe. The kitchen beyond, behind Nana's store always smelled of garlic and aged provolone, but Sundays were drenched with it, especially right after church. She cooked early and I'd find any excuse to dig the tin trowel into the sacks of dried lentils and fagioli, thrilled to feel them clattering, the clinking of a cartoon king's gold. Years later, I found my way back to the empty row house, hoping to recover that storefront's hold, salami slanted 
floorboards, shelves stocked with tins of olive oil and anchovies. I only managed to pry 419 from the cracked door frame to wrap them in burlap inside her old trunk. Now nothing renders the essence of Domenica's place like crushing homegrown basil or pesto genovese, pressing garlic into a bowl of extra virgin oil, twice the measure, plus one clove just for the pleasure. Um, this, the last of the elegies um, I'll read relates to my professional life uh, for 40 years in community organizing and social justice work. And I was blessed to have great mentors and coaches. And I wrote this poem, The Work, for uh, Tom Gaudet, who was an early mentor and encouraged my poetry as well as my work. Um, at a time when we could still visit our loved ones in hospitals. The Work, still at it during lucid spells in the Little Sisters of Mercy hospice, you were cooking up one more campaign, thirsty to call the healthcare machine to account for holding you with vulnerable millions in its maw, you molding strategies as if the tumors in your brain were fed by the persistent spark, that imagination cultivated at beat up tables in storefront offices until all hours in whosever pad you were crashing the powers too well organized for us to rest from pressing slumlords into compliance. So tenants used to rats would learn to forge their own power and challenge aldermen, zoning boards and bankers whose fiat could wave jobs or neighborhoods away quicker than a magician's sleight of hand. If not for the breed of organizers you pulled from your hat and prodded into a thousand acts of resistance action you taught, the lifeblood of a people's organization. Again, I hear your voice in the voice of Vern Sloan, fourth generation farmer in Stryker, Ohio, wondering if it's worth the fight, whether at 82 he should call out the justice boys on Archer Daniels Midland for locking up the price of corn, which might force his livestock farmer son to sell a farm that's been in the family since 1835. Well, he wants to know from me, should he raise a ruckus just so his grandson learns how the world works? The second section of poems are um, an acknowledgement of uh, how for me, both nature and works of art provide both inspiration and consolation. And this is a form, a haibun. I've written haiku for years, and this form has a little prose piece with a haiku at the end. And um, it remembers my encounter with a group of kindergartners in front of the famous Millet painting in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, the Gleaners. Their uplifted faces wrapped before Millet's masterpiece as their docent explains the economics behind the scene how thoroughly the tiny men in the background would have harvested the piles of tares at the women's feet, how they would have bundled their gleanings. The little ones offer their teacher eager answers about one, what one does with blé, volunteering gâteau before pain quotidien. Yet this is Paris 2011, enough immigrant faces among them to know something about hunger and gathering all that's left after even meager harvests. February rain beneath the rose window, votives flicker. Uh, this book is actually dedicated, um, well, the title is inspired by a haiku poet, Nick Virgilio, who I met in Camden, New Jersey over 30 years ago. Uh, I think he's, behind me on the wall here. And one long poem, the title poem uh, was written on a writer's residency in the Adirondacks and involves a canoe trip and a hike. And this last section inspired by the third line of his haiku, having come this far alive at 55, the morning star, in this case, the Perseid meteor shower. Talk of comet dust, 
naming constellations, echoes out over the August chilled lake. This shower of pebble-sized debris our planet's been traversing for centuries, and we're still 15 million miles off, cycling back into the tail. So here we are, spinning through the brilliant litter, waiting for a spark, aching to levitate on one dancing filament to break free of crickets, this great camp, the thin incense of words into the meteor's arc of praise, dust to and shining. And uh, the last poem from this section, uh, a winter poem. Um, those of you who are in the mid-Atlantic may remember a few years ago, we had an eruption, scientific term, of snowy owls from the Arctic, another climate change omen. And I was um, not able to see one, but I was following all of the uh, accounts of their appearances. Eruption. Though accurate, the clinical word does no justice to the debut of a bird that before I'd, before I'd only known from poets invoking white wings over winter fields, the quick menacing dagger of shadow overtaking a mouse or rabbit that never had a chance. This winter, I'm hunting for a glimpse of the majestic bird perched on a hotel entrance awning or drugstore marquee as thousands of snowy owls erupt southward from the lemming-rich Arctic to alight on Delmarva wetlands, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, New Jersey's famous steel pier, wherever a frozen expanse of water, grass, or asphalt telegraphs tundra. A now famous female owl rescued from downtown DC traffic is wintering over in an undisclosed location. That bird grew agitated in captivity, her handlers rejoicing at the slightest sign of recovery from the stupor of poison-laced rodents she'd fed on, a diet that landed her in the path of a city bus and an SUV. She'll soon be released into the wild like the bird in the Times photo, wings extended into a V at the end of the ranger's arm, eyes glinting like coals, like Hamlet's father's ghost. That owl rocketed off into a whirling pas de deux with another Arctic voyager before vanishing as if to rejoin some mythic journey. What insights shall we glean from these visitations, threat or warning? a chance to glimpse the invisible so fragile among us. I'm gonna finish with a couple of short poems from the last section, kind of an odd little section of the book, which collects, um, I wrote a series of poems marking the monastic hours of prayer. And then there are a number of social justice witness poems and, um, I see it as a debate within myself about when silence is necessary and when one cannot remain silent. And this is the poem Terse, February, and that's for the late morning prayers. Terse, there must be a sutra that fits this mess, lumps of melting snow, markers of impermanence, once the unspoiled beauty of fields of cotton, ski slope, starlit sky, now shoveled and plowed, siphoned inward by sun and gravity, old snow with all the elegance of gunmetal helicopter blades churning overhead, soot smudge tattoos on berms of it, foot stomped reminders of imperfection, dirty laundry. Only listen for hymn licks in the slap of slush from tires, bird song layered in like a gospel round, then join in scanning twigs of gray barked trees for bud spritz, that first portent of spring. I don't know about the rest of you, but at this time of year, I get very eager for spring. And then this poem, Starlings, that was inspired by a story from one of my Catholic Relief Services colleagues who 
was serving in Palestine and the news and the birds in question. Starlings. The children swarm outside the supermarket, arms flailing, their high-pitched exclamations surround me, my own arms laden with groceries. My mind suddenly shifts to tally one week's arithmetic of grief. 80 children among the hundreds killed in a fine-tuned cone of shrapnel, three siblings on a Gaza rooftop before the missile landed, and four cousins on a beach incinerated in the time it takes me to close the car door. Tonight, the trees are full of starlings, their racket rising into a delicate tremolo, like in that Bernstein sonata for violin that stretches the strings almost to breaking. Mildred, I have a short COVID poem, but I think maybe time's up, right? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of you who've supported Malaprops by ordering our books today. Oh, I think we can hear your COVID poem since it's- Oh, okay. It is a short one. Uh, this is with kudos to Kwame Alexander, who gave a prompt one day on NPR to write a poem that began with the line, what I'm learning about grief, on grief in a time of pandemic. What I'm learning about grief is that it comes and goes like the shadow in front of me on the afternoon sidewalk. What I'm learning slowly is to welcome it, morning fog rising from melting snow and to fear it, knowing it can pool as a hidden bleed from a fall or wake me from sleep like a siren at midnight. What I'm learning about grief is that I carry it my brother's last words, his hairbrush in my gym bag, my father's hey there in my own voice, greeting those I love and wish I could embrace. But I also carry grief as ballast, smooth stones or a shell from a favorite beach in a jacket pocket, comforting to hold when I find them tucked there now and again. And these days when I place the stories of deceased strangers on an imaginary altar of redbud branch and lilac blossom with a choir of morning doves. I know that grief is not just epilogue, but overture. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. That was very beautiful. I've enjoyed feeling the grace in your work, even when you're talking about grief. And now let's move to Patrice Bethany White, the author of My of America. And what I have to say about this poetry collection is that curious inquiry drives the poems in My of America. Patrice asks the right questions that we may have entertained ourselves about who we are, but are too afraid or polite to voice them because they are troubling, but there's relief in uttering them. Consider this. Why would any woman stage her 21st century wedding on a plantation where masters slaked their lust on the shivering bodies of black boys and girls? These poems make me wonder whether our current social, economic and political predicaments and caused by our hesitation or failure to ask the right questions. Patrice, you're welcome. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Mildred. And thank you to Malaprops. Plantation Wedding. In the middle of my lecture on antebellum plantation life, abolition Lydia Maria Child and William Lloyd Garrison, pronged slave collars hung with iron Christmas bells ringing and Kara Walker's oeuvre, a recasting of slavery for the next generation. I finally vocalize a question I've suppressed while binge watching episodes of Say Yes to the Dress, an inquiry prompted by Southern bells with visions of scarlet dancing through their heads. 
modeling some confection like the curtain dress admired by Rhett. Why would any woman stage her 21st century wedding on a plantation where masters slake their lust on the shivering bodies of black boys and girls? Out in the fields, blood seeps from cow-hided backs, shouldering rough cotton sacks, the ghosts of slaves silent and watching. Mm. So that was um, the first poem, um, My Athmerica. And I'm working on a collection now, um, Scottish Jeans African Tapestry, which deals with the history of my family's enslavement by North Carolina planters. And I'm going to share some of those poems. Dear Ancestor, Four generations past Master Harston, and this line alone would make you spin in a grave, enraged gyre at the promise splintered but not broken, to never see your children's children bound and beholden to any man once calling them slave. Free, I see more than you thought would endure amid Piedmont pines and plantation shrines. Driving to Kulimi on Peter Harrison Road, a new gated walk to bar my way, I realize more than one tourist gathers here today when a family thrusts a 10-year-old child my way. My forebears worked this land, I say. They call it luck and serendipity and arrange a photo, including me. I become the project on the Civil War, a book holding the names of my family as property gripped in a 10-year-old's freckled arm. I wonder how the school report will go after a panicked look when I utter, I was related to the planters who once lived in this house not just chattel abiding in slave quarters gathered round its stately manor. Is it possible to declaim in polite conversation that I shared a great grandfather with the man who kindly served them dinner within the walls of this relict past? I decide to let it go at that, leaving behind the house and the staged faux tangle of cotton vines at the end of the mile long drive. The thrump of roadkill beneath my wheels, I pass a flagpole three banners deep, American, Confederate, and Trump emblazoned on blue. Declare what you already knew. Healing this generation's troubles is long overdue. Oh, America, you are such a dreamer. I am related to a 19th century man who took a black wife and whose descendants would go on to be enslaved for life, to have and to hold till narrati narratives do us part, fragments forever refusing alignment, beginning, ending, or arc. Hemings Family Tour, Charlottesville, Virginia, 2019. One. Peering over Monticello's lawns, a founding father's pillared roost, I tour the layers of history, passing from room to room, pedophile, master, a conflation of ego and blood. I brought my daughters here to learn about slave history, her oldest a lithe 14, same age as Sally when Jefferson made her name synonymous with sex slavery. Dawn mist parts beneath chattel tread, to field, to weave, to blacksmith. Even the trees rustle a sly rebuke. What God alone inhaled, greed choked out in servitude. Two. I listen to the guide parse Jeffersonian genealogy. House slave, field slave, a slave by any other name, still a slave. When he narrows his gaze on me stating, I will never understand how you feel about this history. I want to say, dude, you are the same color as my mother. I thought you were black like me. 
three. Leaving Charlottesville, my stepdaughter leans in, asks if her new mixed cousin will be light or darker than she, signifying even biraciality has its own hierarchy. I do not say one of you can pass, the other cannot. Color soon forgotten, the two cavort like fish at play around the aquarium on this bright summer day. Niece, a sweet surprise, finds time to hug my waist and grab my hand, whispering, you look like my mother. She does not, however, resemble my sister, save her quick temper and eyes. Otherwise, she is her own pale jawline and blonde hair shine. My mother has spent her life telling the tale of our historical misogyny, Gail Jones style, a circular litany. And now we have as many European men in our family producing children as there were during slavery. No judgment here, each relationship based on consent, not rape. Our new history, a much cleaner slate. Mm. And this one starts um, with an epigraph from Harriet Jacobs Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. The slave girl is reared in an atmosphere of licentiousness and fear. When she is 14 or 15, her owner or his sons or the overseer, or perhaps all of them begin to bribe her with presents. Tradition a perilous age in a black girl's life. A chill pricks my heart when I read the name of the third enslaved girl to bear a child at age 15. Conception like clockwork proclaimed. Some gossip to blame for declaring first blood. Ovulation, oblique invitation on the plantation. I pause to record the names of the nascent enslaved and the many who have since taken the bodies of black women, bending them to the will of money, science, nothing. A soul and body dubbed commodity, chattel, property. I learned something of this game in a basement to an Isley Brothers jam. No warning beyond, would you like to dance? Then hardness ground into a hip beneath some dude's double knits, wanting to run but pinned by a palm holding mine in a room full of swaying bodies and sweat shine until the prayed for end to that innocence usurping time. Something's cooking in the kitchen and in the fields. It's bubbling up babies, sun scorching brow and hands. Pick me a wonder, pick me a dream. How many hands does it take to make heaven a dearth of freedom in this God forsaken land? Pancakes keep coming to mind a sestina commemorating the demise of Aunt Jemima on the pancake box 2020. I invoke my great great grandmother's name on exhaled breath, the vowels arranging themselves in shorts and longs, syntax and semantics duking it out, mima that could have been birthed from an African tongue, eeny meeny mima mo respectable marriage of village, continent, and town without a diabolic ja like a pendulum swing to the scarlet kerchief blooming in my brain. Pancakes on my tongue, unwilling to utter that name over black families now living out their American dream. Like reinvention, how the heart longs to reconcile past and present within a village raising a newer child, clawing out of epicurial stink, to swing free from stereotypes, auction block, and Aunt Jemima's mealy breath. Instead, pancakes every time my forebears' syllabics touch my tongue. Mima sans je, not mima or mime. Coy notes stepping out of a history where grits and flapjacks were birthed in a village to skirt my teeth or strut cross my lips on exhaled breath. That ample bosom and backside mocking me. She who longs to rear up and bark breakfast and brunch on a revolving door swing. You are not my auntie or aunt. 
pronounced like the creature crawling out over cadavers of supermarket boxes, choking my breath on a collapsed lung of shady marketing to keep bodies bound in a village come ghetto of stranger than strange, imagined black things. Girl on a swing, dreams culled from Western imaginings of what that colored girl longs to do over a hot stove flipping and flapping because the griddle got her tongue. Names as revenue, monikers on review, line dancing on the hip swing, oh how daring to cogitate on destiny, each syllable a village of preferred ubiquity. Once the Ghanaian name Afua, translated out to first girl born on a Thursday, sonic genealogy on the tongue, but changed to post-baptismal Mary. A rigid catechism of colonial breath blowing across centuries of arid longing. Food me, fooled me, sold me, told me, held me, bled me, tongue of fire with dreams of love, life, and freedom, a profusion of days swinging between something and more. My village compound, my village quarters, my village a city block, each century censoring my breath. What I seek is what I speak, not handed a script of nostalgic longing, Jemima wrenched from shelves, but a litany in my brain still playing out. Ain't nothing but a Jones in to tweak culinary history so my village knows my branches are thick, swaying and swinging with longing and breath, rolling off my tongue, descendancy, blessing, consumption, out. Mm. This is my final poem. A meditation on the toppling of the Confederate statue, Silent Sam. University of North Carolina campus, 1913 to 2018. Mm. Sun glazed statue, too hot to climb, little orphan rebel whistling the old South will rise. Collective whiplash when a woman lies sprawled beneath a grill. In Charlottesville, Nazis bear gruesome grins. Sun glazed statue, too hot to climb, cooked up in America's kitchen over time. The metonymy of warfare, a lad and gun, a whiplash slave, the old South Sun. From the stairs of the Wilson Library, I spy, do not cross tape, and one less sun glazed statue to climb. I reopen a sealed wound the files of slavery, each day a reckoning with ancestry and whip smart visions of the old South's demise. More news of another black face moment, Virginia governor caught culturally misspoken. Sun glazed statues circumventing time, still taunting freedom with the old South will rise. Thank you. That's wonderful, Autris. Thank you so much. And now we will have our third poet reading from Blood Weather, Alice Fryman. And when I read the book, the narratives of self celebrate female agency and the exquisite nature of all things in life, in death, in the stories and, and cycles that build. Alice plays mischievously while mirroring what we choose to remember, how or where we see ourselves as the person everyone is looking for. In all, the poems ask us of one thing, to be awake to what's possible, or even better, in an act of creation, to make what's possible. Alice, you're welcome. That was a wonderful introduction, thank you. That was a wonderful introduction, thank you. You're welcome. In an August mirror. Now is the time of ironweed, knotweed, thistle and heavy heat, shimmering and brutal. Now is the time of no time when all days rise in the oven the same and go forth in single file. 96 degrees, a sea of grasses, too heat stunned to move, 
and I standing in their midst, a foolish woman straining like Odysseus to hear the sirens sing. When suddenly there, from the field's buggy depths of buzz, rustle and drone, rubbing legs and scraping wing, the incessant cry of insatiability, the jittery song of last chance, last chance, each note a letter of the earth's alphabet, each note another stitch knit into the scarf. Never mind decorations of goldenrod and doilies of Queen Anne's lace, or the interminable grasses standing upright and righteous as a society of burning saints. I know who I am. I know with whom I belong. Uh, this is called Lady Macbeth, and I guess everybody knows that story. If you must fault her for having abandoned her own life until it echoed hollow as the crown he tightened around her head. But who can separate the tangled coils of mating bodies? Mm. Having no center, she latched onto his, using the only art she had, the hiss of influence. And he, like a snake, lapping yolk from an egg, drained her. Mm. Think of the hours she spent waiting, hanging on each letter, bathing herself, creaming herself, for wasn't he her all in all? The mouth of him, the sweaty smell of him, the ropey arms she'd crawl into, cherished as the crown she thought she was to him. The him who swore they'd be together, love locked even to the slime pits of hell. The him to whom she gave her everything, breasts, belly, hands, Oh, how he'd fondle her hands, feast on her hands, undress them slowly, slipping off each ring, licking each knuckle. Who was she looking for that terrible sleepwalking night? An empty wraith sucked dry and used up. What was left of her at the end to wash? Whose blood was that? I'd like to read two poems about the uh, death of my mother-in-law, whose name was Daisy. And I guess everybody knows the, st the song, you know, Daisy, Daisy. All for the love of you. Mm. On the day Daisy just plain died, Kenneth Hayden of Benton left earth to shake hands with Jesus and Lakeisha Walker, youngest of six, passed through the gates of heaven. Whether angels sang or if there were hug hugs, back slapping or kisses on both cheeks a la Francais, I don't know. But I tell you, it was a great day here on earth for the Paradise Casket Company, who recorded record profits from all that fancy travel going on. But Daisy, she went sterling, unadulterated, her son holding her hand and singing her out. The song from America's old songbook for the oldest love story in the world. Mother and child, Daisy and son. Never mind his 60 years and her 94. Never mind the platitudes about a long life well to live, well lived. It was mother and son all over again. Michelangelo's Pieta repeated. And if he could, gray hair, PhD and all, he'd have crawled into the cold marble of her lap. If only to be close to the womb he'd come from. That day, 60 years ago, when the two of them laboring all night, rode the high hills of pain, she behind, he in front, head down and coming, 
the way he is now, pedaling hard into that first cold slap of morning. Yeah. After she died, we, my husband Bruce and I cleared out the house, you know, that story. This is called asking forgiveness. When we cleaned out Daisy's house, dragging 126 black bags to the curb. When you packed up the basement and garage, while I opened her top dresser drawer to fold gently, gently, what no mere daughter-in-law has rights to. Mm. Then suddenly, because how could she be gone? I saw her hands again, petting her fresh from the beauty parlor hair the same style as in the photos taken when she was 20. Photos found in a shoebox stuffed with letters from her Robert and the war. Photos you spread out on all the little tables at the viewing, passing them among the guests. See, see what she was. While she in her travel clothes lay among us, oblivious for the first and only time to the choke of your sorrow. What could I do to save you, having myself to beg pardon for? Mm. I stood by her box and sliding my hand in to finger the white collar of her dress, asked forgiveness. For I had taken in my two rough hands the forbidden of another. The cotton crotched, the lace trimmed, the cupped, the pink and final nightgown, the delicates worn and warmed by her, the crushables that clung to her, her fragile comforts, her son. Mm. Mm. This is a, a little old poem I dug out. It's in the book. It's called November Tree. The forest doesn't bury its dead, but stands among them. Last year's leaves curled at its feet, the fallen logs of its kind. If the trees murmur or sigh, crack or groan, it is only the wind. The trees themselves are silent. In all their grace and terrible nakedness, they symbolize nothing. Mm. They are beyond us. How can we bear it? Mm. I think just two more. Um, how many of you, some of you might remember the, poem, the, the old song, Deep Purple? <laughs> when the deep purple falls, you know. <laughs> Well, I, had a, I have a friend who, uh, who loves the, the color purple. And uh, well, this is, this is to her. This is called Deep Purple. Monday and today's job is clean up. I'm humming an old song to keep me company. Something about purple and a garden wall. The children are concerned for it was only yesterday I measured out my future stretching greedy big as open arms could reach. Now here I am backsliding into old lyrics. I'm reminded of a woman I once knew who loved purple, mm -hmm. not lavender, that sickly excuse, but deep purple. She wore it, painted the inside of her house with it, her lips, her nails, the bottom of her pool, where she'd spend long hours floating in tinted water. She claimed she didn't know the song, neither words nor tune written before her time. But there, behind her eyes, behind her studied cheerfulness, it must have existed. Not the doo-wop version that ruined it, but the old one that a patched up woman might have a need for. I know this has little to do with cleaning, except to say her house was spotless, 
not a thing out of place, as if she spent each morning shoving back in a back closet too deep for any rag to reach a memory. I want to think it was about love, about a cherished someone sucked prematurely out of this world, drained away like a slow twilight into the ground, a lingering subtraction that left her lost, wandering in deep purple, nightshade, and sorrow. One more poem, and I, I, I thought I, everybody's poetry was so, so serious. So this is a, I hope a funny one. It's called Playing Favorites. You ask how I feel about my body, my parts. When I was young, I loved my legs. All the places they carried me, long legs, lovely legs. How I'd fling them about, wrap them around, don't ask. Later, I favored my teeth, especially after I almost lost them, hitting my face on the steering wheel, seeing stars. Of course, there's the ongoing affair with hair. Who's not guilty of that? But now, as I'm getting on in years, I admit a certain fondness for my belly. I call her my cheese. Such a comfort, so easy to maintain. No plastic wrap or free refrigeration necessary. Notice I do not speak of insides, which tend to monitor themselves, only my outer delineations, which I'm proud to say are immortalized in art. The Louvre, the Uffizi, the National Gallery, in niches or blazing from the wall, Venuses, graces, muses, bolder girls fattened on glory. Wear sunglasses. Stand in front of any one of Rubens' hefty beauties, proud of her dimpled cellulose and pudding flesh, and see front and center in all her excess, my belly. That gurgling pillow, that buttoned happiness, creamy soft, homegrown and spongy, my big mozzarella. I tell you, if I could bend myself in half, I'd eat me for lunch with a slice of tomato on a hunk of focaccia or good French bread. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alice. And thank you everybody who has read. I do notice we have about 10 minutes for questions. So I will actually open this up in case our listeners out there have some questions for the three poets. And perhaps while we wait for the questions to come in, you could begin uh, by responding to this one. Uh, what does poetry do for you? Because I know many of you write other genres too. You write essays, you write literary criticism. And so what does poetry do for you? Can I answer? Yes. To me, poetry is the great permission. You can do anything. It's freedom. You can say anything. You can write anything. You can imagine anything. You can even say bad things. <laughs> yes, that's what it means to me. And it's been my life. Really. That's very liberating. Thank you, Alice. And Artress and Kathleen, could you respond as well? Hmm. Artress, you want to go first? <laughs> um, sure. I, I guess for me, I mean, truly it is a form. Where it's very revelatory, I think. Um, gosh, I don't want to sound like, you know, corny when I say it, but I think poetry is so visceral. It's so soul bearing. Um, 
I've always felt when I had to deal with, you know, deep topics, um, like the collection I'm working on, I could not even imagine telling that story in prose. No way. You know, it had to be poetry. I had to have shorter lines. I had to hit hard. And the, the, the form allowed me to do that. So, yeah. I guess my thought about poetry and what it um, opens up to me, I, I agree, Artris. I think it, I think of it as soul work. Um, and sometimes the soul wants to sing and sometimes the soul needs to interrogate. Um, you know, uh, I really appreciated your poems today that really interrogated history. Um, I um, try to do that in various ways. And also I think this, um, you may hear in my poems, my Roman Catholic roots. And I think the ritual of naming, the ritual of celebrating, of honoring, um, that poetry lends itself to that work. And I think all, all of those are important aspects of soul work. I think the most challenging thing for me is not to control it, <laughs> to let the soul go where it will in, in language, in imagination. So. Thank you. Huh? Oh, I'll t I'll take that while I'm the. When did you first recognize yourself as a poet? <laughs> That's a kind of a funny one for me. I think I've I've written poetry since I was a child. My mother must have read me poems while I was still in utero. I was the <laughs> oldest of her children, and she was a poet who didn't do much poetry after she started having children. But I think for me, um, it was really while I was living in Philadelphia, hanging out with some very creative poet types in Camden, New Jersey and other places. Um, and then one day I was off in Ocean City, New Jersey at a friend's house and some guy painting the house asked me what I was doing and what I did. And it was too hard to explain my day job. So I just said, I'm a poet. And he nearly fell off his ladder. And that kind of gave me permission to claim it from, from then on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Alice or oh, Artis wanting to add onto that question, when did you first start writing and when did you first recognize yourself as a poet? I was writing poems long before I called myself a poet, mm. <laughs> long before. Um, yeah, I don't know. I it, It's an evolving story. I started writing when I was very young. Um, I wrote really bad poetry in college. I, I don't know. Um, I like to think of it as, you know, this journey where I'm becoming a better poet, but at least I can say I'm one now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I don't know. I wrote poetry for 14 years and hid them in a drawer. Mm -hmm. And I got a divorce and took them out. <laughs> and I, it's a long, long story, but I began um, reading in a local cafe in Indianapolis. Mm. And um, I started writing poetry seriously in my late 40s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once you start, it's like a disease. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like a disease. Uh, because because that's how that's how you think that's I mean I don't know I I live my life confused and I don't know what I think until I start writing it. Mm -hmm. A great response. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And now you have you do have Alice. You do have six poetry collections. So we look forward to more <laughs> because mm -hmm. once you have it, you keep Seven. writing. Seven. And Seven. 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 Perfect. Thank you for the correction. Seven collections and more on the way. And um, we also look forward to having more of your work, uh, Kathleen and, and Autris. And thank you so much for sharing this wonderful work with us this afternoon. So the next poetry or event, Malapros poetry event will be on March 7th.
and we will have three new poets. So I look forward to seeing you all. My name is Mildred Baria, and it's been a great pleasure to share this afternoon with you. Thank you, Mildred. Thank, Thank you, Artris and Alice. Lovely. Great Thank company. You with you today. Yeah, great to hear you. Thank you.